Uh, thanks for coming, uh, all of you. It's very exciting to see all of you in person. We see each other online a lot. Uh, and uh, we purposefully did not open this to the public because uh, David doesn't, I'm going to say like the public, but it's not true. Uh, <laughs> there he is. No, but he felt that uh, it, this is really, a, a, you know, a group study meeting and should remain as such. So I, uh, I'm the direct, besides being a part of a group study, uh, I'm uh, Shafi, I'm the director at Simons Institute right here. And um, just a few words about the Simons Institute. Some of you, usually we have people that have been here many times before, but that's not the case this time. So let me tell you a little bit about us. We are a venue for collaborative research in uh, foundations of computer science. So we, which we define as theoretical computer science plus uh, adjoining fields. And we were established in 2012 uh, due to a very generous uh, gift from the Simons Foundation. And usually what we do is we essentially convene people from all over the world for programs which are you know, focused on topics that are of interest. So we've had lots of um, topics in um, computational biology in the beginning and quantum physics, which keep quantum computation, which keeps going on. We have a lot of data, data science, obviously, machine learning, uh, cryptography, security, and also very basic uh, questions in complexity theory and algorithms. And um, we, bring, we have postdocs every year. We have like eight to postdocs a program. So last year we had about 40 postdocs here. So we are sort of a very big convening place for postdoctoral fellows. And uh, this is a very exciting workshop. Uh, it's a one-off, so we're not part of a semester program. And as you know, the topic is dep decoding communication in non-human species. And I would like to thank uh, David Gruber mostly and Michael Bronson, but mostly David for doing so much work. And I guess I should thank myself because sometimes I answer the emails where is David there. Thank you, David, for all your efforts on behalf of all of us. And uh, I guess just a few things because David is gonna say a word about the workshop itself. So there's going to be food and all the breaks, but you own your own for lunch, but you can, we're not such a large group. We can sort of probably uh, either do things on your own or go again to groups and we can let you know where a good place is to be. It's kind of a break between semesters. So some things are closed, so it's good to find out from us what's open. And uh, we ask not to bring food or drink inside of the auditorium. We're trying to make this, keep it clean. The lockers on the far side of the building you see there if you want to leave stuff and we have our audiographer Omid who's going to help people in case there's a problem there's Ashley who's the organizer she's not here she's done a great job you'll meet her throughout uh, the day so um, without further ado eh, I'm going to hand over the microphone to David <clears throat> Thank you all, and thank you, Shafi, for um, for for hosting us here. It's a it's a pleasure to kind of bring all these all of you all together. Um, this is truly a interdisciplinary uh, type meeting, and um, just some background is you know, and what the project or or how this is all um, fits together is that uh, Project SETI, the the Citation Translation Initiative, um, kind of the ideas began. Um, in 2017, 2018, when we were all Radcliffe Fellows at, uh, at Harvard and started to see the power of, uh, of putting, um, putting different groups of people together to, uh, to better understand nature. Um, and then this project has really grown through the years, um, included many people in this room now and hoping through, through, the, through this meeting, it'll include even more people. Um, you know, and um, really our motive here is to uh, um, listen to and translate the, the communication system of sperm whales. Um, and we're building on um, Shane Garrow's work in the, in the Caribbean and Dominica where we have 15 years of legacy data that has been really instrumental in, the, in this project. So um, uh, just as background, you know, we're covering many different disciplines here. We have um, um, people even in law, um, Cesar, um, that are thinking about non-human rights, um, linguistics, natural language processing, artificial intelligence, uh, dolphin biology, um, cryptography, um, people looking at this from music, roboticists, uh, Rob Wood, our, our, our lead of, um, of roboticists for the project. And um, we also wanna acknowledge the, the support of OceanKind um, and Bryce for really um, providing us the support for putting this, this meeting together. Um, just to kind of start off though, one, one note is, uh, um, over the weekend, we, we lost one of our, our members of our team, um, Roger Payne, who uh, in the 1960s discovered that, uh, that whales sing. 
And um, he was a real kind of, um, he was considered a, a senior advisor for our team. And, um, but he's really a close friend and, uh, and a mentor to all of us. And, um, you know, through the time since the very beginning of the project, he'd, he'd been with us since, the, since day one in a conference we'd held in 2019 at Radcliffe that, that really kind of went from this going from an idea to this is possible. And um, Roger just wrote a piece in uh, Time Magazine about six days ago, um, where he, re he reiterates that um, the work that he had done that began the Save the Whale campaign, which was one of the most successful environmental movements in history, he really had hopes and dreams that this project and this kind of collaboration, and this kind of interdisciplinarity could, um, could be the next step and, and lead to all sorts of goodness that, that, um, that uh, we, we hope to actualize. So um, yeah, thank you everyone for being here. Um, there's a kind of really sweet of uh, diverse talks and um, we kind of organized this rather small so there could be lots of synergy. Probably the, the, the best part of this will be in the side conversations as always. Um, and thank you Shafi for hosting this dinner at your house tonight. Um, so, so yeah, just what? So, so, yeah, so, yeah, everyone has that. So, so yeah, we're just really hoping to, to expand our community and, and build community and friendships and collaborations and, and really showing the power of, um, of bringing people together is, uh, um, and what we can do together is, uh, is a lot more than we could do on, on our own. So um, I'll start with that. And uh, first up, well, there's gonna be one shift though. Um, Franz, um, Franz Jensen was supposed to be here, but um, has some, um, some issues. So he's not able to come, but he'll be the presenting remotely. So it'll be the one remote presentation. Um, and that'll, actually he can't do it later. So we'll, we'll do that after this talk. So I'll try to figure out how, so Brian will come in the afternoon. He's good with that. So, so thank you for that. And I'll figure out how we set up the Zoom for that coming up. And um, so yeah, start out with the first talk, uh, Antonio. Coming off. Okay. Can you hear me from the speakers? Yeah, nice. These are the Just a second, we need to plug in. All right. Um, well, first of all, I would like to thank the, the director of the Institute and all the organizers for having us here today. Um, so I'm very excited about this project and I'm going to present some recent work and some ongoing work that I've been doing with my student, Antonio Arelli at the Sapienza University of Rome. Um, I would like to start with a funny story. So Antonio is now um, visiting a Technion is anyone from the Technion here? Michael. Okay, so Antonio usually has lunch on a, on a terrace at the computer science department. And he used to, to tell me that these guys from the Technion are very unpolite and very unkind because there is a trash can and all the trash is outside of the, of the trash can, okay? So, I mean, if the trash can is there, why don't you put the, your trash inside? <laughs> inside the can instead of outside of the can. And after a few weeks, we found the culprit. So the culprit is this guy <laughs> down here. So this, this raven uh, learned to pull out the trash from the, from the bin by biting the plastic bag, bag and turning it uh, inside out. 
so that all the trash falls out. And then after it's done, can look for food. Okay. So apologies for, for <laughs> accusing your students to do this. Um, all right. So you will agree with, with me that, well, you, we can think of this as some kind of intelligent behavior by, by, by this raven. And in particular, this raven is applying, well, is performing some predi predictive or pr some prediction act. Right? So it knows that if it pulls out the stuff from the trash bin, it will likely uh, find some food, some spare food on the ground. Okay? So, and this is very, very impressive, very surprising, really, and also very funny. Uh, but this is, of course, uncomparable to what we can do as humans uh, as predictors. So what I'm showing here is a solar eclipse. So we as humans, we are able to predict precisely the year, the month, the week, the day, and the precise time when the next solar eclipse will happen. And we are able also to provide an explanation as to when this will happen. We also can explain why. We know the underlying mechanism that gives rise to this kind of phenomenon. And this we can do with a, with a with very high precision and with a a, a lot a lot time uh, a very long time in advance. And this is again this is a predictive act. And if we compare this with what the Raven can do, you can see that the main difference, even just by looking at the slide, the main difference lies in us being able to provide an explanation behind the phenomenon. Okay. All right. So we have this mapping between what we learn about nature and what we can explain. Have you seen this movie? This is Don't Look Up. So if you didn't watch the movie, well, it's a, it's a very funny story. It's like kind of a dark comedy and we as scientists will really appreciate the pain. If you, if you watch the movie, you, you, will, you will really enjoy it. So at the beginning of the movie, this is not a spoiler, this is just the beginning of the movie, um, DiCaprio, He's a scientist, some, some astrophysicist of some kind, and he's sitting in his office, and then he's doing some calculations, and then he suddenly realizes that a comet is going to crash on the planet, and this is going to be an apocalyptic um, event. Okay, so he is very scared of this. And of course, the scientist here never experienced such... Um, a catastrophic phenomenon, but still he is able to predict precisely when it's going to happen and what the consequences will be. So if we compare this with what the, the Raven did in the previous video, well, we can, one way to put it is that the Raven has a very slow learning process throughout, throughout its life. And then when it learns about a new phenomenon and then the Raven dies, well, the new generations will have to relearn from scratch. We as humans, we are able to communicate what's, what we learned about some natural phenomenon to the next generation. Okay, so this is, this is a crucial difference between, between the two. And I want to give an explicit example as to why communicating, well, as to why creating explanations and then communicating these explanations and then using the explanations to do predictions is so crucial also for us humans. So we are from, we are from Rome. And I don't know if you if you ever been here. This is the Pantheon in Rome. And the dome of the Pantheon uses some special kind of concrete. And this kind of concrete, this was invented by the by the Romans several centuries ago. Now, the, the interesting thing about this, this kind of concrete is that the formula for this concrete was lost. So it was lost centuries ago. And then there was no explanations, no, nobody ever wrote or we never discovered an explanation for the formula. So it was rediscovered. It had to be rediscovered several centuries afterwards because we missed the communication step. And well, this, this formula was very important because this Roman concrete has some particular regenerative properties, some elasticity properties that, that make it very, very important. Well, funny thing, uh, 
recently, like 10 years ago, uh, there was some, some progress on, on this formula and this is actually coming from UC, UC Berkeley. Okay. Um, so to improve today's concrete, do as the Romans did. So this was, this was the, the, news, uh, the news on the, on the UC Berkeley website. Okay, so communicating explanations is an important thing. And it, this is probably what makes us unique as a, as a species. Okay. All right. So how do we create progress in, uh, in science? What makes what we call knowledge today is this collection, collection of, of explanations that we communicate throughout the generations. Okay, so this collection is what we call knowledge today. All right, so what we're going to show in this, in this talk, so and I'm gonna leave the stage to Antonio to do that. I'm going to show how we can endow a machine with these capabilities. These capabilities of understanding exist, existing explanations from, for some phenomenon, and also to create new explanations for new phenomena or unseen phenomena. And this is basically what a human scientist would do. So in this sense, we call this process of understanding and creating explanations an artificial scientist process. We're gonna do this uh, by appealing to the notion of language. So, and this is gonna be even more interesting than this because we're gonna do this without actually teaching the language to the machine. So everything will be will go in a sense end to end. So learning the language and then using it to understand explanations and then creating new explanations for new phenomena. So this is what we will call a machine scientist with this and done. So I'm gonna leave the stage for Antonio. Okay, so in this intro for, from Emma, we learned that if we want to imitate humans in this process of making powerful predictions of the future, we have to try to mimic this uh, particular system based on explanations, which led us to uh, potentially an artificial scientist and which will be very similar to mastering a language. Okay, so how can we build such an artificial scientist? Okay, so the, the basic process is to come out with new theories from data. Uh, we call this, this problem in philosophy epistemology, so the creation of new knowledge. And historically, this, this problem has seen two different sides, uh, empiricists and rationalists. Um, the first belief that, okay, knowledge comes primarily from the sensory experience, so from outside. And well, the rationalists believe that uh, the main process is from our faculty of reason. So, what really matters is uh, from our insights, so from our priors. Um, today, we will try to actualize this position in the context of AI and deep learning. So when we have a machine that learns something from data, uh, how we should do it, how we are doing it, like in the empiricist way on the, or on the rationalist way? And can we learn something from, from the past? Okay, first thing, we know that standard and to end deep learning is aligned with the previous view. So we have this big model, we have a lot of data, and we assume that we can read the theory in data. So we do not really come out with some hypothesis a priori. Uh, yeah, we can put some prior in the architecture, but Mm. Ultimately, for example, last year, so there is this universal architecture transformer, which is kind of uh, catching all problems. And we just learn it end to end, end to end. If the theory is very complex, no worries, we just use a bigger network. If it is super complex, we just use a huge network. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the so-called bitter lesson from Rich Sutton. Uh, okay, you can come out with some, fancy ideas for the architecture, some uh, 
really nuances on the data that we can exploit to maybe use a little less compute. But in the end, what really works is just having more data and a bigger network. And actually, we had very big achievements following this rule. Here, I show just two. This is AlphaStar, a uh, uh, system from DeepMind capable of beating, at least sometimes, the best player in StarCraft II, what is believed to be the hardest video game in, uh, ever created, at least, uh, at least professionally. And, or GPT-4, something that now we are very used to. Incredible capabilities, uh, based <laughs> substantially just on the on the simple task of predicting the next token, but with a lot of data, a lot of compute, and a huge neural network. Okay, uh, we have to say this future lesson provides very impressive results, but I have some downsides. Uh, training this. Uh, Networks is very expensive, like millions of dollars. Uh, indeed, for example, for AlphaStar, uh, here the data set uh, had to be generated. So there is a simulator of the, of the process. It is a video game. And this system learned equivalently on like of 200 years, 24 hours per day of playing. Uh, so to generate all this data and then to learn on all this data is a very expensive project, uh, uh, a, very, a very expensive problem. And, and yeah, the, the other downside is that for not every problem, actually for very little, we have a simulator that we ge can generate infinite data. And some, some processes is very costly to, to get the data. And for some problems, we may also be close to the to the limit of the available data. And with the GPT-4, this is already becoming a concern. OK, so uh, is there an alternative route to the bitter lesson to just collect a lot of data and crashing on it a lot of compute? Some evidence suggests that this alternative route should exist. What I'm talking about? This is one of the last world champion of Sacra, and actually was capable of beating that the, the system Alpha Star. And for sure, he have not learned Sacra playing 200 years, 24 hours per day. How he is able to do this? Or scientists. Scientists do not need million of examples to come out with a new theory, and still. Uh, their, uh, their explanation are really fueling our progress. So can we try to mimic more how a scientist operates and works to, for our future machine learning algorithms? OK, so this is the basic intuition of our work. Uh, and so now we should start from here. So how does a scientist work? And here we uh, we listen from a famous scientist what what he says about the the scientific method. This is a lesson from 1964. Situation. Now I'm going to discuss how we would look for a new law. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. Then we compare. Well, don't laugh. That's not really true. That okay. So. Basic principle from Feynman. Okay, how scientists discover new law? First thing, they guess the law. Okay, what does it mean? This really seems uh, what we were talking before. Seems that we kind of need a rationalist perspective shift. So we need to put theory before data. Okay, not exactly theory, conjectures, and specifically falsifiable conjectures. Uh, I will give you an example. This is a recent successful prediction from scientists. Here I'm showing you the data used for this prediction, this new piece of knowledge. Actually, I'm not showing you a sample from the data set. This is the data set. 
all the data that needed to do this prediction is here. So these two samples, what I'm talking about, someone has recognized what we're talking about. Exactly. So here are these two signals recorded on the east and the west coast of the United States. And this is the echo of the gravitational waves uh, generated by the collision of two black holes, one of 29 solar masses and one of 36 solar masses. Uh, they collided uh, together like billions of years uh, away from the Earth, and we recorded the echo in gravitational waves of this event. Now, think about it. All this knowledge about what has happened here, so these two black holes at this distance of these solar masses each, uh, causing waves of this kind, how can you read all this information just in the data? It's clear that the theory should have came first. And in this case came exactly one centimeter in advance, the special th theory of relativity by Albert Einstein. Okay. So as AI researchers, what we can learn from this? How can we build system closer to the working of scientists? And now we arrive to the substance of our work, which is explanatory learning. Okay, so first we need to formalize the scientific problem uh, to make it digestible by machine. Uh, here is a quote from Giorgio Parisi, a recent Nobel laureate in physics from Sapienza, our university. And here's a quote about um, what is the what is scientific discovery? What is the scientific process? And <coughs> he made this analogy with puzzles. So, so many people spend their time doing puzzles. That's it. Research is like putting together pieces that do not seem to be linked with each other, except that if one solves them, they become heritage of mankind. So George Paris is making this analogy between uh, discovering the explanation of a phenomenon and solving a puzzle. And we can really see this, at the big, for example, at the beginning of the scientific era, here is Galileo. Uh, and this is uh, his notes about the satellites of Jupiter. So he potent his telescope towards Jupiter and discovered these four little points around Jupiter and annotated their position over the days. Um, here I, I kind of simplified the notes. So some observations are coherent to what he could see at the time. Some are not, like he never seen two points uh, aligned in a vertical, in a vertical sense. Um, he made these observations and then came out with an explanation. Uh, in this case, this is an extract from this Darius Nuncius, four wandering stars have interfered around a principal star. So what he has seen is coherent with this, this explanation, while other observations are not coherent. It's an interesting parallel with what you said earlier about uh, Feynman saying that first you have to guess the solution, which is not the case here. Uh, I, actually, here I'm, yeah, here I'm showing that he, uh, so the observations, to... and then there's a theory. Yeah, but mm, this this is the final outcome. But now we will look closer how the process of coming out with this theory has really happened. And now we are trying to formalize a problem, and we build this on top of the uh, Jupiter Moon phenomenon. So we build this uh, artificial phenomenon. Uh, this little universe of geometric figures called Odin. Um, here the problem is analogous. So we have some structures. We know in advance that these structures are coherent with some rule of nature of this simple universe of geometric shapes. In this case, for example, there should be exactly one blue surrounded by triangles. For example, this structure is coherent with this rule of nature. 
there is one blue surrounded by triangles. This is not coherent because this blue is surrounded by triangles, but also this blue, so they are two and it's not exactly one. So here uh, we are making this parallel. Um, this is a phenomenon of nature. There is a, a law of nature governing it. And the job of a scientist is to find this law of nature. Okay. Now, how can we do this? Uh, okay. Uh, this is the explanatory learning problem. So we assume to observe a new phenomenon. So we do not know the law of nature in advance. We just have some observations like Galileo. Uh, is this enough? No, this is not enough. We, this is a very limited set of observations. We can craft any explanation that can be coherent with this little data. And here we come to the, to the point. So we have to assume something else. What we assume? We assume to have already some explanations for some already explained phenomena. So this is uh, uh, mimicking like uh, the work of the scientists of the past. So uh, science, science is in this sense uh, using a language which is understandable to, to, to others to communicate an explanation which will make us able to make new predictions of the phenomenon of interest. And how can we learn this language? We need some data on this. And this is given by the past explanations. Uh, but we should look at this, uh, at this past explanations as if they were in an unknown language. So we are trying to model in the problem of becoming a scientist, but from being like a child. So a baby is not able to uh, look at a science book, learn the uh, like formulas from astrophysics and make prediction about eclipses. He first has to learn the language through which these formulas are communicated, then under, so that he can understand them or she. And then using these formulas, we'll be able to make these predictions. And eventually, there will be a new phenomenon that no one has already discovered an explanation for them. She or he will discover this explanation and write it in the same language so that then the next generation will be able to use them to make predictions. OK, uh, last thing we need to formalize the problem. Actually, there may be different way to uh, phrase an explanation for this phenomenon. Like there are different ways to write, for example, the law of general relativity, and many of them are, are coherent. So we do not want to uh, evaluate the, the process just by looking at every symbol that should be exactly as we expect. We want that the meaning of the output explanation is coherent with, with what we want. So instead of um, looking at the output explanation, we uh, have some test samples to make prediction on. In this case, like 1,000 new structures, we have to predict their coherence or not with the rule of nature. And, and then that's it. In, in our formalization, if our system will be able to make the correct prediction for the new structures, we will say that he had discovered the explanation. OK, so this is the final problem. We are given uh, some observations, so some structures with the, the tag, if they are coherent or not with the law of nature of the phenomenon. Then we are given a new structure, and we will be asked to if this structure is coherent or not with the rule of nature of that phenomenon. And our problem is to find this f that has this binary input output. 
okay, so how can we find this F? We can just train a neural network end to end. This would be the empiricist approach. Um, we would see that this approach, uh, uh, this approach is based on a parametric hypothesis, which is represented by the weights in this case of the neural network, and which should be continuously updated during the training. So during the training, there will be the gradients that adjust the weights. And since our hypothesis is the weights of the neural network, this hypothesis is continuously updated through the training process. And we will see that this will cause some generalization gaps. So literally in the performance of how much we will be able to solve this problem. Then uh, every prediction made about this system is not really explainable. Um, we will see in, in which sense this kind of prediction is unreliable. Um, and also there is this strange thing that very simple phenomenon or very complex phenomenon really are requiring the same amount of computation. And this is kind of opposite to our intuition about the, the problem. Okay, uh, how can we instead think a rationalist approach towards this problem. So in the rationalist approach, we need, uh, we have said that we want the theory coming first. So the conjecture coming first. So we need to model some sort of creative act that generates this conjecture or better several conjectures. And then we have to model the process of falsification. So where we take these conjectures one by one, we compare them with the data we have, the data may be coherent with the conjectures or not coherent with the conjecture. In this case, we will discard the conjecture. Okay, so we try to model this process. How we model it? Uh, this is exactly uh, the process described by Popper uh, about uh, how science work in, in his work called critical rationalism. And so we model this process through two neural networks, a conjecture generator and an interpreter. Oh, notice that here, the hypothesis is no more the weights of the network. Here, the hypothesis are these language propositions created by this conjecture generator that then can only be accepted or refused or refused in their entirety. Okay. So, uh, how we implement this, uh, this idea? Uh, on the empiricist side, this is just an end-to-end -end neural network. On the rationalist side, we have these two neural networks. Uh, here, the conjecture generator will generate some conjectures in a language which will, will be interpreted by the interpreter, which takes an input, a conjecture, a rule, and a structure. And um, how these two models are trained? Uh, we're supposed to have this data set of, uh, we already have said, this phenomenon or, already explained. So, uh, explanations in an unknown language. So we do not make any, we do not make any assumption on the map, on the language. This is just a sequence of symbols. And for each phenomenon already explained, we have the sequence of symbols and then some uh, tagged structures. So structures and the tag that says to us if this structure is coherent with the rule, this unknown sequence of symbol or not coherent. We train the conjecture generator to generate the sequence of symbol from the observation. So we train it in the empiricist direction. So to generate the explanation from the data. But we do not stop there. We train also an interpreter in the opposite direction. So we train the interpreter to take in input the explanation that we have. Then we take one of the observation we have, we remove the tag, we give the structure in input to the interpreter and we want the interpreter to predict the tag. 
So we train the two systems in this way. While for the end to end model, we just predict, uh, train the model to take an input, a collection of uh, structures of tagged structures, a new structure, and to predict the tag of the new structure. Okay, uh, all these neural networks are transformer. Actually, we use the very same architecture and a model for the conjecture generator, uh, the interpreter, and, and the and the end-to-end -end pieces model, adjusting some some pieces to have the correct input and outputs. But in the end, the two models have are almost the same number of learnable parameters, so that they are comparable. Um, we actually train two kinds of empiricist models, one that just predicts the tag, and then also one that try to predict in output also the uh, symbolic explanation. So you should assume to have here in the conscious empiricist model, another arrow that tries to guess the symbolic explanation. Okay. So now uh, we are to experiments. So first thing we compare these two approaches. So the critical rationing networks and the previous models train end to end. Okay, so, uh, so a note about the data set. So we generated this data set of um, uh, phenomenon in this Odin universe. Uh, we are like 1,400 phenomenon in training. Each phenomenon has 1,000 of uh, target observations. And then at test, we have 1,000 new phenomenon. So with explanation completely different from the one from training, but it use the same language. Um, so how we test this, uh, these two models, we test them on finding the explanation for the 1,000 completely new phenomenon. Um, Sorry, is the explanation unique? Not necessarily. The explanation is not necessarily unique uh, in, in two senses. So in the language we have built for this universe, uh, the very same explanation may be uh, uh, phrased in different ways. For example, you can say there should be at least uh, one pyramid and at most one pyramid. This is equivalent to saying there should be exactly one pyramid. So you need some kind of parsimony, right? Some kind of Occam tracer. Uh, yeah, so in, in our work, we just uh, want to see that the explanation is correct. So even if you provide the longest one, for us, it's okay. But uh, clearly, one can implement some kind of Occam razor in, in this step and give like uh, a positive way to the shorter explanations. Um, okay, so these are the, the, the results. So on 1,000 new phenomenon, the critical rationalist network is able to discover the explanation, the correct explanation for more than 700 of them, while the best empiricist model stops at 200, Actually, please. Can I ask Bob for that question? So there, if there's nothing incentivizing the conjecture generator to, to you know, short so that might be worse than fixed time thinking, right? Because then it might scale with the number of samples. Uh, yeah, memorizing the, the samples will not work because it won't generalize, but yeah. it might still scale somehow with the number of samples, like the number of conjectures needed to generate, like to do a forward pass through your whole train thing. Okay. Uh, it might grow with the number of samples, which is worse than if you have a fixed architecture. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, there is this very relevant parameter here, which is how much conjectures we are generating. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, this is a nice thing because we can control this parameter. Like, if we expect that the, the law is very simple, or maybe we have a lot of data here, then we can just generate maybe two, three, five conjectures because we expect the conjecture generator to already do a good job. Yeah. But if we expect the problem to be difficult, then maybe we can let the conjecture generator generate many conjectures, then, then we, we all test. So this is some like bias. You're like biasing the, the network because you have some prior knowledge over the problem. 
Yeah. Or yeah, maybe prior knowledge or just how much resources do AI have to spend on this? Yeah. If it's the former, then it would be fit like the problem with the with the fixed uh I can't see it now, but mm -hmm. the fourth arrow here, the fixed thinking time was that you're using one architecture for simple Fs and for complex Fs. Yeah. Where if I knew how complex my F was in advance, I would like to use less like parameters bigger... for simple Fs and more parameters for more complex Fs. Okay. So the apples to apples comparison would be adding this bias to that baseline no and i'm just saying um i'm just thinking uh, and i'll stop now because i don't want to oh okay pick it back up but um shouldn't then like if you're if you are uh letting the your model scale with the complexity of the no no but the model is not scaling actually the the number of renewable parameters is almost the same and in the end the empiricist model has, has more parameters because as Two different decoders, but it's, it's almost the same. And actually, we use the very same architecture. The point is that there we can exploit search. Yeah. While here, yeah, you can do some sort of search because it's a transformer. So you can do like a beam search on the explanation predicted. But this search is not as effective as a search like in the conjecture space. I see. Okay, so yeah, I, I don't mean the number of parameters, I mean the total time for a forward pass through the model. Okay, clear, clearly, clearly, if you want to check many conjectures, you need more time. But the point is, okay, suppose I give you more time here, what you can do? Uh, yeah, deeper beam search, stuff like that. Yeah. So you, you just do not have a way to spend this more time. So is this, just to make sure I understand, is the empiricist model, like, is this a meta learner? It's conditioning on the entire input data set and then making predictions in the output data set? Or is it just like a classifier that you're optimizing uh, on the little data set? It's just a classifier. So it's a binary classifier. Okay. And in input, there is some observations from the new phenomenon. Okay. 32 actually. So, you're, you, so on this set of a thousand phenomena, you're learning one set of parameters and then yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. And so this input is exactly this. So okay. we're supposed to have, okay, there is a new phenomenon with a new uh, explanation. We're supposed to have 32 observations of this phenomenon. So structure target. And we want the model to discover the correct explanation. Not really discovering the explanation, but to be able to tag correctly 1,000 more structures of this phenomenon. And here, the, the metric we are interested in is this NRS. Uh, and yeah, just the, the rationalized way is much better than empiricist one. This is an example from the test set. So these are the observations. This is the ground truth rule. So there should be at most one blue pyramid pointing up. This year, N came out with this rule, zero blue or at most one blue pyramid pointing up. Which actually is equivalent to this one. There is this zero blue, which is or which is not really necessary. With some sort of outcome razor, we could have uh, discovered it. While the this is the rule for from the empiricist conscious model, so the one that also tried to predict the the rule zero one blue touching or or. And actually, we do not have any guarantee also that the the output rule uh, here. But also for the business model, is really a correct rule, uh, grammarly speaking. Uh, okay, so can I, uh, that's also a question. Oh, sorry, no, go ahead. I just wanted to ask. So, so to specify the generalization is in learning the language, right? So you are not trying to learn from previous rules to the new rules, right? So the generalization only in the internal representation. Yeah, here we generalize. We generalization. I mean, how much? Uh, uh, the model is able to find the correct explanation for new phenomena and make predictions for new phenomena. So but this is other phenomena mean. are completely unrelated to the new ones. So unlike let's say real science, where probably you can draw anal analogies between things that you that you learn right or uh, laws of nature maybe repeat themselves maybe in different contexts at different scales. So here you assume that it's completely unrelated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
the, the assumption that we think holds also for real science is that even in real science, if we discover something new for a new phenomenon, we will write a paper which will be in the same language of the older papers. This is the crucial idea. So if we discover a new thing for a new phenomenon, maybe we introduce a new meaning for a word. This happens a lot of time, but the paper is in English. And if a physicist read the uh, paper about the special relativity from Einstein, he is able to understand it because he knows the language. So he will, he will model also the process of mastering this language to be able to understand this explanation. So from like the, the practical point of view, the difference in, in the model, is it actually the, especially at training time, the only difference is this kind of bottleneck layer on the CRN where you're forced to output like a sequence of characters? Yeah, I, I will not put emphasis on the fact that this is a bottleneck. Right? I mean, uh, in, in some sense, yes, this is important because this space is small, so we can search in this space. But I think also there is another important um, thing to, to put home from here is that here there are two directions in, in this problem. One is from the data to the explanation, and the other one is from the explanation to the data. And which may resemble also the causal and causal in the, for example, in the causal uh, learning literature. And one of the two is much simpler to learn, which is the one from the explanation to the data. So the job of the interpreter, also, we have this intuition that is simpler. We, we have to learn, given an explanation, given a structure, say if this structure is coherent or not with this explanation. And this is a much simpler problem that, okay, I give you these 32 structures, give me the correct explanation. And here the idea is, since this direction is much easier to learn, can we exploit a model very good at doing this to relieve and make it uh, make work also a model in the direction we are interested in, but which is not that good. And this is exactly what is happening here. Okay, another cool thing of, of this model is that this, uh, the final prediction, the prediction of uh, attack for a new structure is very interpretable. Like this is, uh, a bit forward thinking, but imagine to have uh, a machine learning algorithm like this for a bank, which is deciding if giving you a loan or not. Uh, so, okay, loan then it. So the, the output is for our structure. So for example, my profile for the bank is, okay, no, you will not get a loan, but this prediction will come from an explanation in a language that can be, for example, Okay, to not pay the loan in the past, and you are resident in a district with a high rate of insolvency. Now we are able to understand this explanation, and we can say, okay, but this is unacceptable to me because why the the loan should be based on the on where you live, and we can just discard this explanation, put another one here, to not pay the loan in the past, and then we get. We are guaranteed to get a new prediction, which is based not, which is based on a new, on the new explanation that we have put there. So we have some control on on the input. Then the interpretation is given by the model. So this is exactly what I do for my job. <laughs> we need to use uh, boosted trees because we need to provide Sharpie values. And so my question would be, would you be able to hook up a CRN to an existing model, which would be deep learning based, okay. and then decide whether this person is a good borrower or not? Would you be able to distill that with the CRN and output uh, explanation like this? Okay. Uh, mm, this is our vision. So we have, we have tested it on this toy problem of, in this universe of geometric figures. But here there is this, so could you replace the, the universe of geometric figures with a model? I think we'll 
uh, give me the answer is yes. And the point is to frame the problem as an interpretation problem. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you can link your prediction to an explanation, which is in a language, then you can use the, this CRM framework to learn an interpreter rather than, for example, uh, a common approach, especially at the beginning of the interpretation uh, research was to like produce an, uh, an explanation post hoc. So yeah. you, you, you have a prediction, then you have a model that given the prediction gives a reasonable explanation. And this is, uh, to me at least, this is unacceptable from an interpretation point of view. But here, the prediction is caused by the explanation. And if we alter the explanation, we are guaranteed to have a prediction with, which is based on, on the altered explanation. So just for your example, right? So you could train a booster tree on an output of a deep learning model, but that will not pass like legally in America. We cannot de decline somebody because you have a surrogate model. Okay. Right? So that's the crux of the problem. As you said, it's not it's entirely acceptable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please. I'm just wondering, you're, you're probably building to something, and I'm wondering, and, and since this is a workshop on communicating with other species, I'm wondering what you're building to with this in hypothesizing something about communicating with other species. Yeah, so uh, here uh, we have made a strong connection with uh, the problem of the scientist. So coming out with an explanation, which is based, so what the, the scientist is doing is solving a communication problem, kind of the for the next generations. And if we want to solve the problem of the scientists, we cannot assume to have um, to know the language in advance. So we have to assume to have this explanation written in a known language as the language, for example, of another species. And so the, the strong parallel, and this is the last thing, uh, the last experiment I will show, is that here, the data from which we are learning are observation from the nature, which here are these uh, structures in this geometric figure process, and some symbolic sequences that are in a known language and to which we do not need any assumption. So we do not need to assume that this is English or, or anything else. So this is a showcase of what we can do with a data set of this kind. So some sequence of symbols, which we assume they are describing something in nature, and some observation from the phenomena of nature we are interested in. And actually, we started working on this from the scientist perspective. So, okay, how can we imitate scientists? Then we realized this strong connection with language. Uh, and this is why we are here. But then there is the final experiment that I think is very, uh, in, it's the one that interests us the, the most in this, in this uh, respect. Okay. Uh, okay, this is another cool thing of deconstruction that when we check all the conjectures with data, if no conjectures is compatible with the data we have, we just discard all of them and we output an unknown token, which is a thing that in the end to end setting is just not possible. Um, and yeah, that is what we were discussing before. <clears throat> So that we have control on the on, on this variable, how many conjectures we should generate. And if we expect if we have more compute or we expect for some reason for some bias a more complex phenomenon, uh, we can just let the conjecture generator try more and then we will test all the conjecture with the interpreter. Okay. Okay, now we come to the experiment that. Yeah, uh, this is the, the final thing I have to say. Uh, uh, then we made this final experiment. So here we are comparing two different CRN models. So 
Now we focus on the interpreter. In one case, we use the learned interpreter, so the transformer, trained on the, on the data set. And then we compare this CR, CRN model with the learned interpreter with a CRN model that used the interpreter brought by us to generate the data set because uh, we have generated the, uh, we synthesized the, this geometric figure data set. So we wrote an interpreter in Python. Um, so this interpreter can replace the interpreter of the CRN model and we can use it to discover the new explanation. This interpreter clearly is perfect. He will never uh, give a wrong prediction for a structure, differently from the learned interpreter, which is very good, 99.9% uh, .9 accuracy on giving the correct tag for a structure, but it's not perfect. Now, uh, the experiment we made is, okay, which C CRN is better in finding the explanation for the new phenomena? The CRN using the, the learned interpreter or the CRN using the hardcoded interpreter? And now the surprising fact is that when the learned interpreter is very good, so close to 100%, but not necessarily predicting the, the correct act, 100% of the time, the CRN using the learned interpreter performs better than the one with the code interpreter, the ground truth one. And why is this the case? I mean, the code interpreter is perfect. It never happens that you have, for example, there should be at least one red and here is predicted wrong. If we'll always give the, the good prediction. So the point is that Generating the, the conjectures is a difficult task. We do not make any assumption on the language here. So sometimes the, the conjectures generated are not respecting the grammar of the language. And when this happens, the code interpreter just broke. And even if here there is a simple, a simple swap or, or maybe uh, a nuance that it's not altering the meaning, but it's just altering the, the grammar, like when we have like a missing comma in a C program. So is it like, so Michael was mentioning dialects in the whale language. So if you have different dialects and those sequences or symbols are whale sound sequences, you're robust to the, the presence of a dialect with a dialect. Yeah, for example, here, uh, I think that here a, a big takeaway uh, take is that uh, to learn a language, one should be able to be resistant to this uh, slight alteration of the grammar and, and still figure out a meaning. Uh, and here uh, we show how to do this, really the interpreter should be learned and cannot be hard-coded. Okay, so that's it. And Can you go back to this, uh, to summarize uh, again? Uh, yeah, this, this summarizes the, the four points we discussed before, but uh, in the conclusion I made the, the, the three main takeaways I think are, are relevant for for this workshop with uh, respect to our work. So uh, the problem of mastering a language is uh, very similar to the problem of creating an artificial scientist in the sense of finding the explanation for a new phenomenon. That putting a language hypothesis space in the middle of a deep learning model is uh, can be a good thing for a number of reasons, like interpretability, like more generalization with the same amount of data and the same amount of compute, at least at training. And that if you are interested in 
in learning uh, a language to make predictions, so not to learn to make ju just the, the perfect string of symbols we desire, then we need a system that is capable of interpreting simple autonom uh, autonomously. So we cannot hard code the interpreter the meaning of the symbols. Um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, so, quick question. Um, well, maybe with the positions in the context of uh, non human uh, species uh, communication. So, we often have some communication of, let's say, sperm whales plus some behavioral information. So, they may be chatting and then, for example, decide to, to dive. Uh, so, in your context, uh, that would be uh, the, basically the alternative to these binary labels, right? So, we can, uh, for example, uh, ask the question whether certain communication uh, is really to the behavioral pattern. Now, the, I think the main difference here that I see is that they have a lot of clutter, right? So you have maybe some pattern that is indicative of that communication that let's dive, but you also have some other stuff that you don't know uh, that might be completely irrelevant, maybe part of a different conversation. So how would that be modeled uh, in your approach? Okay, uh, here what, what I was imagining is that, for example, uh, we have said that in world communication, yeah, we have these clicks, which are the main language for us. And so I have this string of symbols here. And here, this modeling, I think, is very powerful because we do not have to make any assumption on this string of symbols. And then pairing with this, we have some information from the context, like uh, the body language, maybe some the widths are making, maybe what we are registering with the drones. And this may be here, like, OK, this body language, we are registering it, but never with the whale saying this. So this body language is not happening with this uh, particular saying, uh, or maybe we here we can have okay. This thing is always said when there are there is a wheel sleeping, for example. So this is wheel sleeping. So this is uh, how I imagine to to okay. use the sequence of the, the geometric symbols in your example is actually the observable phenomena, right? So that would yeah. probably correspond to to the to the clicks. Uh, whereas the language will be something latent, some some kind of your internal representation uh, into which you're translated, so to say. Okay, okay. This, this is another. Yeah, this is another way of saying this, and then this having like maybe the English translation. Uh, yeah. I think uh, we'll stop here and we'll continue more questions later. But um, we just want to stay in, stay in touch and not have to go into that. Okay. Okay. Well, we're at a time now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.